So, uh, I, I uh, said, I, you know, I myself, I'm in a lot of pain. I hope you will stay awake and, and alert and you won't regret uh, inviting me to teach a class. I'm going to blame the poor attendance on the weather, not the announcement that I am the teacher of this class tonight. But I don't think the Bible is that difficult to understand if you want to be pleasing to God. Now, that doesn't mean there, that there are not some difficult places in the Bible. But I really think you don't really need to understand them to be pleasing to God. Stick with what's clear, what's understandable. You do that, you'll be pleasing to God. Is there some things in the Bible that a lot of people find difficult to understand? People interpret them differently? Well, yeah, because it's an ancient world. It's an ancient customs they had back then. And we're different. We're even a lot different now than when I was a young man. I mean, I went last night, and uh, a friend, in fact, my wife said, you should have been working on your lesson, but I went, a friend of mine, I've been trying to share with him and reach out to him for a long time. He wanted to go to AUM, because over at AUM last night, there was a debate between a law professor at Faulkner and uh, a woman. And I forget, she's, she's not at AUM. She was invited by AUM, but she's not a faculty member there. But she's involved in some kind of LBGTQ group, if you know what that is. And she got up and talked about her wife. And they have an adopted child in Birmingham. And she's trying to get rights for lesbian women, lesbian couples who are married to have children. And I just, you know... I mean, if, if it were like 50 years ago, I would have never dreamed as a young man, you know, growing up, that you would ever have United States, and that's, an, that's a marriage. I mean, I, I love them. I love everyone. I'm not trying to, um, you know, be uh, critical or anything like that. But, I mean, I just, that's totally against what the Bible says. But that just shows you how our culture even has changed. Corinth uh, was a wicked city. It was a very wicked city. And it had a lot of customs and cultures that the people had in opposition to that wickedness that I think are strange to our culture. And this is one of those passages. I think uh, every Bible class ought to begin with reading the text. And I've got a lot of slides. I might not go over all of them. But let's begin with the most important part, and that is the reading of the text. Now, this is my own translation uh, if you've got any questions, comments, or anything about it, uh, feel free to bring them up. I commend you. I like that better than praise. I commend you for remembering me, Paul writes, in everything, and for holding to the teachings just as I pass them on to you. Now, I want you to realize that the head of every man is Christ. And the head of every woman, and that word could also be wife, so keep that in the back of your mind, wife and woman, either one, is the man or the husband. And the head of Christ is God. Every man who prays or prophesies with his head covered shames his head. And every woman, wife, who prays or prophesies with her head uncovered, shames, and that's really the meaning of the word, shames, put to shame, her head. For she is no different than a woman whose head has been shaved. Now if a woman will not cover herself, then let her also cut off her hair. But if it is a shame for a woman to be shorn or shaved, then let her cover herself. Now, a man should not cover his head, since he is the image and glory of God. But the woman is the glory of man, or the wife, he uses a definite article, but the wife is the glory of a husband. For man did not come from woman in creation, but woman came from man. For this reason, the woman should have authority on her head on account of the and I'm going to translate it male messengers. I don't think they're angels. I don't think they're celestial beings. 
I think they're just plain old messengers. That's what the word means. You find it that way in Luke 9, 51 and other places. But we'll talk about that later. But if you prefer angels, you can put it there. In the Lord, however, neither woman is independent of man, nor is man independent of woman. For just as the woman came from man, so also the man comes through woman, is born through a woman. But all things are from God. Judge for yourselves. Is it proper for a woman to pray to God uncovered? Does not nature itself teach you that if a man wears his hair long, it is a disgrace to him, but if a woman wears her hair long, it is her glory. For long hair is given to her as a covering. Now if anyone wants to argue about this, be contentious, love to argue literally is what the word means, we have no such practice. Neither do God's churches. Now there's some, even that last one, people have a debate about what that means. But what is Paul talking about here? I'm just going to throw it open. We have many years of students of the Bible here. And I, I don't want this to be like a lecture or I do all the talking unless that's what you want, but I mean... We have many years of people who've read the Bible, studied the Bible. And, uh, but you also have to know something, I think, about the ancient culture to really understand what's going on. I think if you do, then it's clear. But does anybody have studied this, maybe? Maybe you've studied it more than I have. You want to, or maybe you just want to take a shot at it. We've got some young people here. What, what could it possibly be talking about? Anybody have any idea at all? The veil. Very interesting, Paul. The veil. Some people have said the length of a woman's hair. Some people have argued maybe it's some kind of hairstyle. The way the hair is done. But Paul mentions the veil. Some item of clothing like the veil. Anybody else? Anybody else think it refers to the veil or maybe the hair or something? Uh-huh. Okay. 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 Anyone else? Well, uh, he makes a statement I think it's important that you just brought up. For she is no different than a woman whose head has been shaved. So if your head is uncovered as a woman, it's just like your head is shaved. Now, I had an image, I didn't uh, bring it, of a woman, it was a Muslim woman. And she went without the veil. And she actually dated a Christian. She was in a college in New York. She's 18 years old. You can find it on the internet. I was looking for some image. And it showed her her head was shaved. How would you feel if you were a woman, some of the women in here, and your head, you were forced to have your head by your family or by your peers, maybe at church, they were to gang up on you and say, look, you either get your head shaved or you're not a member here anymore or something. Some, some kind of peer pressure in some way where your hair was completely shaved. If you were, had your head completely shaved, how would you feel? How would that make you feel? You'd be upset, wouldn't you? Would you like to go out in public with your hair unshaved? Is that something you would like to do? Would you like to go to school the next day with your head completely shaved and everything? No, you wouldn't, would you? Wouldn't you feel a little ashamed if your head was shaved? That's exactly what they wanted to do. There are statements in ancient literature when a woman's hair was completely shaved off. There was a famous play. It was Peri Keromene which means she who was shaved, bald shaved. Uh, Peter Brown translates it, the girl with a shaven head. But this play takes place in the city of Corinth. The very city where Paul 
is writing this letter. Everybody in Corinth knew this play. Everybody in antiquity knew this play. It was written by Menander. He was perhaps the best known and one of the most popular writers of antiquity. Menander, you might not have heard of him. Uh, it's interesting, a lot of his plays were lost, believe it or not. Uh, they just found some of them here in the last oh, century or so, but they were not uh, copied. They were uh, done for entertainment. And uh, they spent more time entertaining them. People had them memorized. Uh, it was kind of like TV or going to the theater back then. People went to plays. He's been called the father of European comedy. But he is certainly uh, probably one of the greatest names in ancient comedy. This is what they call new comedy. They had old comedy. And this is what they call new comedy. Old comedy was kind of like burlesque or slapstick, making fun of certain situations. And then after a while, they had what they call new comedy, where you'd have situations where there can be like real life. And this particular play, uh, probably called Mene, or uh, She Who Was Shorn, is an interesting one. It tells about a story about a man. Here's what Ovid said. Ovid wrote... The Art of Love, maybe some of you are familiar with that in the first century. He was very risque as a writer. And they were changing the Roman Empire. Ovid was one of them. Julia, who was the daughter of Augustus Caesar. A lot of famous people were trying to change uh, the Roman Empire in the first century. And it became much more wicked, much more loose. Julia was, was very immoral. Ovid, this is the art of sexual love that he wrote. But he makes a comment there about Menander. So long as there are lying slaves, hard-hearted fathers, wicked pimps, and seductive courtesans in this world, Menander will never die because he tells stories about them, entertaining stories, and people enjoy it. That's their entertainment. They didn't have television. Didn't have theater. So they went and saw plays. And Menander's plays were some of the famous this is a papyrus that they found uh, back in the early part of the 20th century. It only contains about 40% of this play. So we don't have the whole thing. But we have enough of the story to know what's going on. In this play, she who was shorn or shaved, her head was shaved, Menander tells the story of a man who lived in Corinth with his mistress. He's not yet married her. He's thinking about it. She wants him to. But she, he's not gotten around to uh, proposing to her yet. And so what happens is, he's away in the army, in the Corinthian army. He comes back, and after he's been away from home for some time, he returns to his house and he finds his girlfriend in the embrace of his next door neighbor. And this next door neighbor is kind of a scoundrel. He's kind of a rascal, a playboy. He thinks he's, you know, something for the ladies, a ladies' man. And as a punishment, he has the head of his mistress shaved. Okay? Her head is shaved. As a punishment for her, they weren't doing anything more than just she was out there and she was embraced, but she also had no veil. She had her veil removed from her face. You'd have to read the play... It's very entertaining as a play because, come to find out, she knows that the next door neighbor is her brother. And what happened was, when she was born, the two of them, they were uh, not identical uh, twins, but they were twins. And uh, the father, the mother died in childbirth, so the father exposed both of them, which means he left them to die on the side of the road as infants. And a woman took the uh, daughter, the, the little girl, baby girl, and gave the baby boy to someone else. And then later she learned that this next door neighbor is indeed her brother. So their embrace was nothing that was sexual or anything. But that's not what uh, the uh, man thought when he got back. He came back and here he's coming home and he's hoping his wife or his mistress, rather, girlfriend's going to be waiting to see him, happy to see him. She is next door, and uh, she is embracing this man. 
And uh, anyway, it's an interesting, very entertaining story. Valerius Maximus is another writer, and I could have put several writers in here. He says, from the founding of the city of Rome down to its 520th year, there was no case of divorce between a man and his wife. Carvilius was the first to put his wife away. He mentions it, it was so rare that they didn't have any divorce, and it was so uh, rare, so strange for the first divorce to happen, people remembered it. Rome was, unlike Greece and unlike Corinth, a very moral nation at one point. And it changed radically in the first century in Paul's time. A lot of it was the influence of Greek culture and Greek gods. But uh, even beginning uh, in the century before Christ, Carvilius divorces his wife. In another place, the same writer mentions the second Roman to divorce his wife. Uh, see, suspicious Gallus. Gallus was a council in Rome. He was one of the top uh, leaders in Rome. And he divorced his wife because he learned that she walked abroad with head uncovered. She went outside and didn't have anything on her head. Question, what was she supposed to have on her head? What was she supposed to... Now, I could show you other places where if a woman went outside without her head covered, that's why they shaved her head. Because it was something that they considered to be uh, scandalous. It's like a woman doing something that is beyond flirtatious. You're doing something that is shameful when your head was uncovered. We'll talk about what that is. Talking about the hair? Talking about the veil, Paul? If so, what kind of veil? But it was something that was considered shameful. Now, not very much in the past. In the Victorian age, that's in the 1800s, do you know that it was scandalous, it was shameful for a woman to have her ankle bared? Now, that's in the Victorian age. You did not wear a dress that came just down to your knees and you could have a bare uh, calf and a bare ankle, ladies. You couldn't do that in the, in the Victorian age. That was considered scandalous. That was considered very shameful. That shows you how much our culture has changed. Now, uh, I think it's the daughter of Bruce Willis been going around New York and she's going around topless, I think. I saw that somewhere on the internet and I haven't seen it in too many places, but one or two places, and she's trying to bring that in vogue, like that's fine. Well, at some point, God would, I'm certainly, he would certainly say that is improper, that is shameful. And as Christians, we've got to recognize there is a line there somewhere, right? I mean, you guys recognize there has to be a line somewhere, you know. I mean, the ankle, I don't think it's that, though, do you? You think it's, I don't think it's the ankle. I think a woman can wear a dress, appropriate length, I, don't th I think she can have a bare ankle. She doesn't have to wear shoes or knee-high socks or something like that. But at some point, you see every culture, you have that which people in that culture consider to be proper, and there's that which that culture considers to be improper. Today we have Muslims, and for them uh, to not wear a veil, that is scandalous. That's scandalous. We'll talk about what that is. What does it mean with her head... Uh, uncovered. Does it mean that she's got some little doily on her head? Is it talking about something like this? Because, you know, when you read commentaries, that's what people think it is, Bible commentaries. Paul, I don't know what you think, but they think it's something like this, right? Huh? Yeah, Paul thinks it's something different, and I do too, but, but uh, they think it's something just like this. And why do they think that? Well, uh, because that's what they find when they look at images and statues and things from antiquity. This is Nancy Carter. You can find her on the internet. Got a PhD from the American University there in Washington, D.C. And she says the veils that were worn in Paul's day by Greco-Roman women did not cover the face. Um, Gordon Fee, New International Commentary on the New Testament, wrote a commentary on 1 Corinthians and he says uh, there in a footnote uh, that uh, it's unfortunate 
Some translations like the New Revised Standard Version, Revised Standard Version used the term veil or unveiled instead of covered because there's no evidence of this veil that covers the face like Muslim cultures have today. Well, uh, it's true. Uh, here's a statue of the wife of Augustus, and her little veil is, is what I got you know, on my head there. It's this little thing up here like that. Can you imagine how expensive it is, though, to wear, to, to, to have a, something like that, a statue done? How expensive it would be? It takes several days. You're paying somebody who's an artisan, right? I look too silly. You, you, you're paying somebody who's an artisan to carve this statue, a live statue of you, right? You're posing for it. Can you imagine how much money that's going to cost in today's dollars? You'd have to come to your house day after day to carve something out of marble. This is a marble statue. Uh, very expensive. Uh, here's a coin. A coin that's got uh, Livia. And she's wearing a little veil. Uh, here's another one. This is one of the Vestal Virgins there in Rome. Again, what they consider to be a veil is that little hood bonnet-like thing over her head. But if you were to assume, just for the sake of argument, that the veil in antiquity was supposed to cover a woman's face, what wealthy woman of that day would pay the expense to have a sculpture made of her wearing a veil like this? I mean, just think about it for a minute. You're going to spend all this money, you're a wealthy woman, and you, and you want your, your uh, features carved so all uh, posterity can see it, and you're going to have a, a face where all you, all you can see is her eyes, you don't recognize who she is or anything like that. I mean, first of all, to me, that's a, that ought to raise a red flag. Now, later in chapter 14, Paul says, as in all the churches of the saints... Let the women be silent in the churches, for they're not allowed to speak. But they must be in submission, as the law says. For if they desire to learn something, let them ask their husbands at home. For it's shameful for a woman to speak in church. Now, you remember in chapter 1, where he said, If a woman uh, prays or prophesies with her head uncovered, she shames her head. It's a root, the same word, shame. It's shameful. Not dishonor, uh, not, it's something that involves shame. Now what's the connection? What is shameful about it? What is shameful? Why was it shameful for a woman to speak in church, in the church assembly? This is why when you read a lot of commentaries, I remember uh, Gordon Fee says this in his commentary. There's another commentary, Baker Exegetical Commentary on the New Testament. Uh, David Garland, he's the president now. Uh, of um, Baylor University, Baptist School. But he says, you know, we don't understand the connection between the head covering and these women praying and prophesying. Now think about that for a minute. There's got to be some kind of connection. What's the connection? They miss it. They don't, they're, they're not looking for it. I think it's because in order for a woman to speak publicly and be heard, she's going to have to drop this veil. That's the connection. See, so you're trying to talk, and you want to be heard, and, and uh, so, you know, Paul says, you know, even to ask a question back then, it's improper, he says, uh, let your husbands ask the questions for you, but, but in, the, in the public assembly, uh, it's, it's shameful for a woman to speak. What's the connection between speaking in the veil or the covering? It's this. These women are dropping the veil so that they can be heard. Now... I'm going to show you evidence of that. In order for a woman to drop, to be heard, a woman would have to drop her veil, otherwise it's getting in her mouth, especially if she's trying to project and, and talk loudly and to be heard. But the veil was a sign of modesty, and it was a symbol of a wife's submission to her husband. And so when a woman dropped her veil, then that was something that was shameful in that society. Even back in the old times, this was true in every ancient culture, by the way. There's a dissertation that just came out. I, I just got it. It's called Aphrodite's Tortoise, the Veiled Woman of Ancient Greece, 
Lloyd Llewellyn Jones. My wife said, another book? We don't need another book. You're not even teaching school now. But I had to get this book because it has the very theory that I have had all along and the ancient evidence I'm going to show you here in a minute. And he's marshaled it together. And you can see the veil there goes across her face. And there's other images he has in here. But the most important is the textual evidence. But the veil covered her face. Tamar, in Genesis 38, she's got something that's covering her face, a veil, so much so that her own father-in-law, Judah, could not even recognize her. And so he thinks she's a courtesan, right? Sleeps with her. She gets pregnant. Remember, her husband died without a child heir. And she, he died and she was childless. And her, his brother refused. So uh, Tamar went to Judah. And since Judah didn't force uh, his other son to have a, have a male heir with her, then he allowed, she allowed Judah, trick Judah. And remember, he says, you're more righteous than I am when she turned up pregnant. But he didn't recognize who she was. How in the world could, she not, how in the world could Judah not recognize his own daughter-in-law? Because of the veil over her eyes. In ancient times, it was shameful for a woman to allow a man to see her face unless he was her husband. Now, there's ancient evidence that says this. That's why uh, Gallus, remember, I read, you, er, read to you earlier, divorced his wife, the second man in Rome to do it. Why? Because she went out without her face covered. And you say, now, why is that so? Well, it's the way that Muslims feel about it today, if you've studied Muslim culture. You see, because adultery starts with the smile. And they know they, the woman is a little different. You know, men are more visually oriented when it comes to sexual arousal, right? That's why Playboy made it as a publication and Playgirl really kind of went by the side. There's something different, I think, broadly speaking, between maybe Jerry could speak more authoritatively about it, but there's a difference between men and women. And the culture is, I don't want anybody to see my wife's pretty face and her smile but me. There's a place where Plutarch mentions in the Roman questions where he asks a Roman, he said, now why do the little girls go around without a veil and the married women wear a veil? And he says, well, that's simple. Because the young girls are looking for a husband. And the married women want to keep their husbands. I, maybe you have been in a restaurant or something. And across the room, you're married, but across the room there's a beautiful girl who looks at you. I've been there. You have some kind of uncomfortable, there's eye, your eyes are meeting or something, so I just look the other way. I usually have a book when I'm in a restaurant if I'm ever by myself. But it's, it's that look. And that's what they're trying to interrupt with the veil. The veil goes over the face and uh, a husband doesn't want anybody to see how beautiful his wife is. Her smile. Doesn't want her to smile back because that in their minds is when the adultery begins. The playing into the mind. When eyes meet and there's an exchange of smiles and they want to short circuit that. And so they have the veil. In Genesis 24, 65, Rebecca covers herself with a veil when she sees Isaac approaching toward her during her first meeting. Shows that she's a chaste woman. Chaste women veiled themselves in antiquity. And that's what uh, Llewellyn Jones shows in his dissertation. Uh, that w a chaste women... There, there was another woman, I'll just mention this. Back in 1931, I went all the way to Emory University with my wife. Back in 1931, this is the journal... American Journal of Archaeology, uh, the woman uh, was a Catherine Galt. And she, she said back then, when she read that little passage I mentioned of Plutarch about the young girls and the married women, and the young girls don't have a veil, and the older women, married women, wear a veil, and, and the guy asked, Plutarch asked, why the difference? She said, all these images of these veiled you know, ladies with a little doily on top of the head, not over the face. That doesn't make any sense. It doesn't make any sense. And, and so now you find in here where there's images 
where you might see the veil off to the side or something, but he, he definitely shows that the veil covered the face. But I didn't need that dissertation um, because there's actually a statement in antiquity that describes it to a T, describes what I'm arguing to a T. It is the author Dio Chrysostom. Again, in the that time of Paul. It's in the time of Paul. This is his first Tarsic discourse. Tarsic, because he's writing to the city of Tarsus. Now listen carefully to his words. In days gone by, in the past, therefore, your city, what city? Tarsus. Tarsus. Tarsus, where Paul was born. Your city, Tarsus, was renowned for orderliness and sobriety, and the men it produced were of like character. But now I fear that it may be rated just the opposite and, be, and so be classed with this or that other city I might name. And yet many of the customs still in force reveal in one way or another the sobriety and severity of deportment of those earlier days. Now notice what Dio is saying. Times are changing. They change in the Roman Empire in the first century when Christianity comes. The times change. But the city of Tarsus still holds on to some of the old customs. You see that? Of those earlier days. One of them, he says, is the convention regarding feminine attire. A convention which prescribes that women should be so arrayed and should so deport themselves within the street that nobody could see any part of them, neither of the face nor of the rest of the body, and that they themselves might not see anything off the road. It's the veil. It's the veil that's blocking them. Now, the word veil doesn't appear there. And not a lot of people are familiar with this passage, and some people think, well, that must be some kind of exception in the east there in Tarsus. But Dio Chrysostom was well-traveled. He lived in the city of Rome. He traveled all the way to the city of Alexandria, spent some time there. He's well-traveled. And when he talks about the city of Tarsus may be rated just the opposite and so be classed with this or that other city, he's talking about pretty clearly his familiarity in his travels. He was from Bithynia, but he was well-traveled, lived in Rome, like I said, in the capital. He says, consequently, beginning the process of corruption with the ears, most of them have come to utter ruin, for wantonness slips in from every quarter through the ears and eyes alike. Therefore, while they have their faces covered as they walk, they have their soul uncovered and its doors thrown open wide. So the influences that they hear, that's what he's talking about. But their faces are covered. Okay? It's clear that we're talking about a veil that covers the face. This is in his second... Tarsic, uh, first Tarsic Discourse, it's uh, Discourse 33. And uh, you can find all these, by the way, over at Amridge University. I got somebody to get the whole collection of them over there, the Loeb Classical Library. Writing a little later than Apostle Paul, writing to Paul's hometown of Tarsus, Dio Chrysostom admits that times are changing and that some women in his day no longer want to keep the ancient custom of wearing a veil. You can see up here, Muslim women. And the two in the front are wearing the face veil, and the two behind them are not. Because a lot of Muslim women want to be like the Western culture. So uh, there's a difference even in Muslim countries today. But that was the, the true in antiquity, and that's what Llewellyn Jones proves. He says it's no different than Muslim culture today. In fact, Muslim culture is a good uh, paradigm to show uh, what's going on in this passage in 1 Corinthians. There's no contradiction. Some people think, oh, if a woman just wears the veil, covers her head some way like this, she can pray and prophesy. Well, she wouldn't wear the veil if it were in a public meeting. You didn't wear the veil at home with your family. Women didn't wear a veil when they talked with each other in the streets. In fact, she would undo, one woman would undo her veil like this, the other woman would undo her veil facing her, and they'd have the veils up, and they could talk freely with each other, and nobody could see them, okay? And that's what Muslim women uh, will do. But a lot of people think, well, 1 Corinthians eleven five 5 
if she would just cover her head, she can pray and prophesy in the church. No. And some people think it's a contradiction with 1434. Uh, in fact, a lot of people want to say uh, 1434 and 35 is an interpolation, or there's, there's some evidence that it's not original with Paul. Well, that's not true. The wearing of the veil obstructs a woman when she wants to be heard. Here's a Muslim woman, woman and she's trying to be heard with a microphone. Uh, but it interferes as she's trying to speak. Um, and that's the connection in 1 Corinthians 11.5 with the people, with the women removing the veils. Paul's not implying that if they just wear the veil like this on their head, they can pray and prophesy. And a lot of people are saying that. A lot of people today, even in the church, are saying, oh, well, women can pray and prophesy publicly in the church. Um, they don't have to wear a hat, but there are some people that believe women have to wear a hat just to attend church based on this passage. But I think people are missing the point. These women want to get up and speak in public in the church. And to do so, they're dropping their veils. And Paul's first point is, I, what you're doing, don't you know, is shameful. Now, I know the culture's changing, Roman culture's changing, but it's shameful at this point in their church. There's no contradiction. Paul does not want a woman to speak or to pray publicly in the assembly. Because the first thing is she has to do is remove her veil. But there's also something else that he brings up. He wants the men to lead prayers in the church in 1 Timothy 2. He wants them to teach. And a woman is not to teach or have authority. She's supposed to have authority on her head with a veil. Show her husband is her authority. Now, a man should not cover his head. Well, uh, when would a man cover his head? Plutarch tells another story about Scipio the Younger. Roman politician. He comes to the city of Alexandria. He walked through the city with his toga covering his head. Now the people of the city quickly noticed him and quickly surrounded him and insisted that he uncover and show his face. Why? Because you've got to be up to no good. Or you're doing something that's shameful. You don't want to be seen. I mean, it brought attention to themselves. A man who's walking, and he's walking around just with his eyes like this. And that's what women would do. They would wear, he's, he's either dressed like a woman or he, somebody is doing something that's very suspicious or shameful, but it was something that people in that time and culture took immediate notice of. When a man walks and he's got a veil or a toga covering his face where you can't see who he is, something's wrong. And Paul says, you know, you're shaming your head. When Paul says you're shaming your head, do you think he's talking about this head? Or, since the head of every man is Christ, do you think it's a double meaning? See, I think it's a double meaning. I think he's shaming his head like you're doing something kind of shameful wearing this toga around your head, and you're also shaming your head, Christ. And I think the same thing's true of a woman. You're shaming your head. Now, if anyone wants to argue about this, Paul says, we have no such practice, neither do God's churches. What does Paul mean by that? If anyone wants to be contentious about this, someone wants to argue about this, someone wants to, don't, doesn't want to go along with this, what do you think Paul means when he says, neither, we do not have, we have no such practice, neither do God's churches? What could it possibly mean? Or maybe somebody has another question. I should have stopped at some point and asked questions. Very good. There's no commandment. There's no example of any woman praying or prophesying in the church. That's what he's really talking about. Now, if anyone, and he uses anyone, it could be masculine or feminine in gender. So if anyone wants to argue about this, that's really what the word means, love to argue, love to debate, contentious. Whether a woman can get up and speak without a veil in a church. He should know that we, Paul means me, I, have no such practice. Where I've been as a minister, where I've been as an inspired apostle, we don't have a place where women get up in the public assembly and lead a prayer or prophesy and give a prophecy. That's what he's talking about, not some private thing. A woman didn't wear a veil covering her face when she was alone or with her family. The veil shows that it's a public assembly. 
And neither do God's churches have such a practice. So what Paul says is, what you were doing in Corinth, it's never been done before anywhere in God's churches. That's what he means in that culture. These women getting up, not wearing a veil, this is something that from Paul's experience, it's a first time episode in the church. To his knowledge, a woman getting up and praying and prophesying in public, and of course to do so, she removes a veil. I think that's what Paul means. There is a leadership hierarchy. Paul gives it in 1 Corinthians 11. Here's his chain of command. I praise you for remembering me and everything and for holding to the teachings just as I passed them on to you. Now I want you to realize the head of every man is Christ. And the head of the woman is the man. And the head of Christ is God. Every man who prays or prophesies with his head covered, you're shaming your head, not just a literal head, but shaming Christ, who is your head. And when a woman gets up and she does not wear the veil, she's shaming her head. Not just her physical head doing something that they regarded as shameful in that culture, but you're doing something that really brings reproach on your husband. It's something that would be very risque. It would be like in the Victorian age, a woman coming in, and she's showing her ankle. She's showing her leg bare from the knee down. In our culture, what would it be? A dress that's hiked up pretty high, low plunging neckline, maybe something very considered very shameful, something considered risque. That's what Paul is talking about in uh, 1 Corinthians. There is a chain of command that we have to respect. God is over Jesus. Jesus is over man. Man is over woman. And it's no more shameful for a woman to be uh, in submission to a man than it is for a man to be in submission to Christ than it is for Christ to be in submission to God the Father. That's really what all of this is about is about the hierarchy. Paul says later, I do not permit a woman to teach or have authority over a man. Uh, the sexes are equal before God. I think that's the meaning of, of Galatians 3.28. There's neither Jew nor Greek, slave nor free, male nor female. You're all one in Christ Jesus. That's not talking about there's no distinctions. There's no such thing as elders that we have to be uh, obedient to. There's no such thing as bosses at work. Okay, He's not talking about our relationship uh, to one another. He's talking about our relationship to God. There's no difference with God. There's no difference in Jesus Christ. Whether you're a slave, whether you're free, whether you're a Greek, whether you're male or female, everybody's on the same footing. But uh, he does say in um, Ephesians 5 that women are to be in submission to their husband. And I'm going to pass over that. How often do you see, though, a mother all alone, taking her child uh, to church. You don't often see the opposite. You see, you see uh, women. So if, ladies, if you want to have a husband who's a spiritual leader in your family, then don't assume that role in your family. Your husband needs to be the leader. And he finally says in 1 Timothy 2.8, I want the men to pray in every place. And I think that means uh, everywhere. It means in every place. You can look at different examples, but it means uh, in every place. Well, that's the bell. Um, anybody have any questions or comments at this point before we leave? I just think it's, it's one of those passages where, you know, you don't really have to understand it. Go with what is clear. I want the men to pray in every place. Pretty clear, isn't it? Pretty clear. Wives, submit to your husbands in all things as unto the Lord. Pretty clear. Uh, verse 12 in 1 Timothy 2, I do not permit a woman to teach or have authority over a man. I mean, we can argue about what that reason is. God has a reason, but that's pretty clear. You don't have to understand the difficult passages. Just stick with what's the clear passages, and we'll be fine in being pleasing to God. But I hope that tonight I've made, perhaps made 1 Corinthians 11 a little clearer for you, because I think it says the same thing that's said in other passages pretty clearly. But Paul's raising a cultural point in 1 Corinthians 11. Anybody have a final comment?
Yes, in the back. Yeah, all that's cultural. Uh, I think 1 Corinthians 11 shuts that down. I mean, I can see people think that, but there's a hierarchy that Paul gives in 1 Corinthians 11. That's theology. That's not culture. Uh, God being over Jesus Christ, that's not part of our culture. That's God's way He wants things to be. Jesus being over man, that's not culture. The question was, you know, maybe the, the roles of men and women, that was just a culture at that time. No, uh, this statement right here by Paul is not culture. It's what God teaches. And we need, I think, to respect what God teaches. Um, anybody else? Well, I think, you know, to be pleasing to God, you really just have to stick with what you understand. And maybe tonight you don't think you are pleasing to God for some reason. Maybe you need to become a Christian and you understand what you need to do in order to be a Christian, uh, to repent of your sins, be baptized, and you will be pleasing with God. Maybe you've done something else. Uh, maybe you just need our encouragement tonight. I mean, I need encouragement. I'm grateful for the encouragement that this church has been going through a difficult time that I've been with this uh, surgery and the pain I've endured. But if for any reason we can help you in any way, won't you please come as we stand